Hello, welcome to the Embers Podcast. I'm your host, Ernesto Irena Montejano, and this podcast is recorded in Boyle Heights, California. Hello, uh, first of all, if you're listening, thank you. I appreciate it. This is very first podcast. Um, I've been thinking about doing this for a, for a while now. Um, it's like either I procrastinated, I was lagging on it, or I was either broke or didn't have enough time, you know, but finally it's happening. I've been wanting to do it for, for so long, like I was saying. Um, at one point, I was going to do a show called In the Embers, and it was going to be a video show uh, produced by Susan Wren in, in Hollywood. And I just wasn't cut out for that. You know, me and Rafa kind of talk a little bit about it. But eventually I was like, I have to do, I, I want to be in a place where I love having conversations. I like sitting around with my friends and, you know, either having silly conversations or deep conversations. But to me, you know, having human connection and like building stories and like understanding, you know, each other in a deeper level is, is very key to my life. You know, it's one of my favorite things about about life and about being social and I'm not the kind of guy that like likes to go out to parties and hang out and and do all that I get a lot of anxiety but the one-on-one times is my favorite and you know I get to I get to learn a lot about my friends and and myself as well you know um so this podcast that's you can expect a lot of nerding out you could expect a lot of goofing around and you know I'm going to talk you know, sometimes I'm going to talk politics for my friends, other times sports. You know, I'm a boxing and UFC fan. I'm also a huge comedy fan, uh, really into music. So all around nerd. Um, so, you know, we're going to be we're going to be hopefully talking to a lot of interesting people. So for the first one, you know, like I was saying that in the Ember show, Rafa was actually going to be my producer for that. And, you know, it ended up not going through. I wasn't ready for it. But I felt like, you know, this is derivative of that idea. And so I was like, Rafa's got to be my first guest, you know. So, you know, I got to talk to him last night. We had a great conversation. Um, I was pretty excited that, you know, I think the first one went pretty well. But you guys will be the judge of that. Um, but, yeah, Rafa, a little intro on him. Rafa Cardenas, he's a photographer here based in Boyle Heights, you know, East L.A. area. Um, I think he's a very important uh, photographer. He does a, a lot of amazing work. He's very sincere in the way he captures, you know, Raza and the way he captures Los Angeles. It's very, um, it's very honest, very gritty. But then he, it, like his work has an elegance to it that I really appreciate. And, you know, re- recently he had a book uh, released a couple, you know, last year uh, titled Masaka. And it was an instant classic in my eyes. You know, I really, I really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah. Anyways, here's the episode. Thank you for uh, listening. Hello, hello. All right, so this is um, the first conversation here with Rafa Cardenas. Um, here we go. Yeah, so uh, thank you for, for coming out today, man. Thanks, tonight. Ernesto. Really honored to be the first guest on Embers. Yeah, I Dope think spot. You got the brand new mics. You got the brand new system right here. Yeah, I've been, uh, you know, you know, people that don't know, a couple of years ago I posted on uh, on Instagram that, you know, me and Rafa are working on the show in the Embers, um, and it was going to be a video show that we were working at a studio in Hollywood, and... Um, yeah, Susan Wren, sweetest lady. She's a producer there. She owns a spot. She used to work for Viacom. Really amazing woman. She wanted to give me a show where I interview people, and you know, I and it was video. And then uh, Rafa was going to be the producer, you know, helping me put together the show, finding the guests, figuring out the questions, all of that. And um, 
I we went in to do just like the promo stuff and I just melted. I hated it. You know, I don't like <laughs> I was just self conscious. I was sweating. I'm like greasy and, and like the they they kept on putting like the powder on my face to take off the shine and it was I had like like a thick like, you know, quarter inch uh, cake of a <laughs> uh, powder on my forehead. But you know, eventually I was like, I'm gonna do a podcast and that was like a year and a half ago and then whether it was me being broke or not having enough time, I didn't do it. And now it's like, it's on. And I was like, my first guest has to be Rafa. Cause you know, yeah. you were part of the embers and now Sweet. you gotta be a part of this. You my, know? my favorite thing about the day that we recorded that <laughs> promo to the show in the studio, <clears throat> the video promo was that we spent like eight hours just trying to find what shirt you were going to wear yeah, yeah. <laughs> instead of rehearsing. Cause you know, <laughs> I'm self-conscious, but was- I can that was pretty exciting, though. I mean, it was fun. And we had the opportunity to give it a shot to actually be in the studio and to try it. You know, it was still dope. So thank I can, you. it could still happen one day. She yeah. always tells me, hey, man, whenever, whenever you're, ready. you're ready. And I'm like, I'm not ready. <laughs> yeah, we need we need some practice. But um, yeah, no. So you got a lot of exciting stuff you're working on. Your book came out recently a couple months ago. Um, yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about your book? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, Masaka I came out over a year ago, but I mean, last okay, April, sorry. actually, it's a year. But um. And um, it's been doing well. I have only a handful of copies left and I'm kind of just going to hold on to those. That's why I had like the last book sale last week. And that's only the limited edition version. So the limited edition version is kind of pretty much gone, but you can still get um, the eight by 10 version on my website. Um, But, you know, if you really want that limited edition version, I have a small handful left and just hit me up. Yeah, where could they, where could people hit you up on? Oh, you can hit me up through my website www.rafa.la. So that's r a f a dot l a, and just go to the contact page and hit me up. Awesome. Yeah, I love that book, man. I, I've gone through it a, a lot of times, and you know, there's the stories. You know, you there's a story for each photo. I mean, that could be said about any photograph, but just knowing you and and the kind of you know generous, sincere person you are, you can see that through the photos. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to share that story of, of, the, of the family that the saw the, the relative um, in that photo. I mean, that's an amazing story. Yeah. When you get to like, well, my book opens up with a, a, a birth and and some kids in, in early childhood. And then it, I get to a part in the book where there's some teenagers. And one of the shots is teenagers in um, Boyle Heights. I was walking down Indiana near Olympic, just walking around with my camera, you know, shooting. And these Kids, you know, uh, were just chilling in a van, long shorts, black socks. Um, and they were like, hey, why don't you take our picture home? <laughs> I'll be your model, you know, <laughs> something like that. And um, at first, as I was walking by, I was like, oh, man, I better not say nothing. because <laughs> You know, you just so, never know. Yeah, yeah, you just never know. And it was one of those one of those moments where they just like laughed at me with my camera. And I, I went along with the joke. I was like, yeah, man, I'd be glad to take your picture. Like, you know, if you let me and they were like, yeah, go for it. So they were um, goofing around. Well, they were trying to be really hard when I was shooting, but they were goofing around before it. But I tried really hard to get the photos of them goofing around because I wanted to. I wanted to see their smiles and not their 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 hardness, you know, yeah, um, the in that photo. Yeah, because yeah. they were young kids and literally like each one is probably at that time was younger than 15. But, um, you know, they were also hard street kids. So I was waiting for that moment where they laughed and a few of them smiled and I got that shot. And that's a shot that I ended up putting in the book. Well, a lot of times when people look through my book, they see buildings in there like, dude that building's gone oh you, you 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 got that image you know that memory oh that building's gone doesn't look like that anymore but in that book it got to that page and somebody said dude that's the kid that um was killed by the cops by the sheriffs and they're right now suing the company suing them the sheriffs because it was um you know there's no Wrongful death. Yeah, yeah, wrongful death. The the supposedly well, they don't want to turn over the the cam shots and, but there was somebody that had footage from their home, and the cops didn't know that. So the person that did the home video that had the home system, gave it to the family, and the family then went to a lawyer, and wow. so they they it shows where the cop shot the kid and then dragged him from where he was and turned him around. So mm. all that stuff allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. Because it's all still in court. But um, the family reached out to me and they were like, you know, in tears. And was like, we found out that, you know, you took this photo. And I was like, they told me the story. 
so I, I went over to the family and, and um, um, gifted them a, a, a framed image of that, you know, just like one of those crazy moments, you know, where it's like you don't know, you know, and that little image of the kid with the smile, you know, sitting on yeah. the back of a pickup truck turns into like this moment, you know, it's crazy. It's yeah, crazy. no, I mean, I love, uh, that's why I love photography, especially, you know, you're able to capture time and, you know, that's one of the, one of the few things that just as humans, we can't control, we can't control time and being able to capture, you know, create memories and, and hold, you know, certain spaces, um, pretty amazing. And, um, yeah, no, so I, I wanted to, you know, chat with you about, um, you know, I, I, when I, when I met you, I always thought that like, you're like the most like East LA person <laughs> of all time. I was like, this dude's like, he, like when I think of East LA, I think of Rafa, you know, and then, you know, later on I found out, you know, you're, you're from uh, Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. You were born in uh, Jalisco, right? Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk a little bit about that early, early Rafa life? What do you mean? Uh, like, you know, what, what's in town? Do you, what do you remember from there? Like the food, do you remember? Where uh, I was born? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't, I don't remember anything. I came when I was four years old. And I think I have a memory of when I was a kid. But sometimes I just imagine that that's probably a story that my parents tell me all the time. But I don't have any memories of, of being what's, a kid What's in, the town's name? I was born in a small town called Piwamo. It's in Jalisco. It's, you know, it, you know, dirt roads. And I was born on a dirt floor, you know, in, in a, I don't know what the house is made of, but way back in 1971. And um, little my little, my family migrated north. Um, my brother Richard was born in, in Ensenada. So m my sisters and I were born in Piwamo. My brother Richard was born in Ensenada. And then my youngest brother that passed away, he was the only one born in LA. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so he was like, my parents came first, and then they had him, and I guess the anchor baby. <laughs> 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 and, then, uh, and then we came after. <laughs> so we stayed with my grandma for a little while. So you were, you were four years old then? Yeah, I was four years old when we came to the U.S. Wow. So something like that. Oh, where, where, was your, where, where did you stay at with your grandma? Four. Yeah, I was four. Uh, we came in 1975. Um, it's the same place. In, yeah. in Piwamo. In Piwamo, yeah. yeah. And then, well, then we moved to Ensenada, and then, you know. Oh, so you are in Ensenada too? As far as I know, for a little time. So wow. we, we never really claim Ensenada. But that's where... That's where my other brother was born. Richard. Yeah, it's crazy. I've known you yeah. for a long time. They didn't know you. You lived yeah. in Ensenada. That's awesome. Um, yeah, no. So we, we were talking about, you know, on the way over here, talking about different stories. Um, you know, when you were mentioning your brother, it reminded me of, of uh, you know, I'm from El Centro, grew up around Mexicali. And one of our, when I was a kid, like one of the local, like local hero bands was this band, Los Tiranos del Norte, right? Oh, from, yeah. uh, and they had a very famous song when I was a kid. It was uh, Hasta la Miela Marga, right? And, and. What my memories of that song, it was always like me, my parents dressing us all like Norteño with like the hats and the boots. And we'd go to like Christmas and New Year's to my grandma's house. And, you know, they would be playing music and we'd be, you know, hanging out. And that's and then when I hear those, those songs, I always think of that. It just shoots me back into that time. And uh, one time we were listening to Tiranos here and you're, you, you start telling me your own story. And, you know, I don't know if you wanted to share a little bit of that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a song that always reminds me of, of my brother that passed away. Um, he was killed in 1993. But that that song, it's Hasta la Miela Marga de los Tiranos, it was the hit back then, you know? So at that time, we were all young. My brother was 19, and, and that's just a song that he'd always sing when he was happy and drunk, you know? It was, <laughs> it was like the song that he would sing when he'd put on whatever, you know, hat or boots you know too to you know just like have fun because it was when like quebraditas were like all over the place the Party. Went to that, huh? <laughs> yeah <laughs> parties were <laughs> parties were all about that and um the radio stations around here you know were were playing a lot of that and so that song was just a big hit and my brother he would always sing it so when he passed away that became like the song that we would all get drunk and sing to him you know hasta la miel amarga cuando el amor se acaba so it's like when when that love is gone or when something is gone, it's like, you know, even honey tastes sour. That's what it says. So it's yeah. it's it's a it's the song is actually about, you know, a, a man and woman love or, you know, a, a love of two people. And, you know, it goes sour, but it turned into um, a song about, you know, a memory of somebody, you know, and uh, how life has really sour moments, really sad moments and. And and 
se me enchina hasta el piel nada más de recordarte, you know, like stuff like that. It was just like, it was a perfect song. So it kind of became like the song that we remembered him with a lot. We, yeah. would, we would sing it every time that we were drinking. Heavy, heavy on the tequila. Yeah, that <laughs> one and Mi Ultima Parranda. <laughs> Yeah, that's Mi ultima parrana, damn. Those two songs, like, together, we could just go loop them, back put them in back. a loop, and just, like, keep drinking and singing them to him. You've been sober for how long now, Rafa? Five years. I, I don't know if my math is right, but it's, it's <laughs> between four and five. Um, Yeah, five years. And that's, you were telling I'm me the other day that, that it was because of, the, that like, that royal jelly stuff helped you do that? <laughs> is that you were telling me? Yeah. There, well, there's a lot of... <laughs> layers to why I stopped drinking but you were telling me that but, it helped right yeah yeah, yeah. so Royal <laughs> Jolly <laughs> when I was like uh, before I actually like quit drinking and I was like trying to look for answers and trying to be healthier I was going to the senora and I actually did a logo for the senora that sells honey she's now right there next to Casa 0101 that honey shop right in front of the police oh yeah station. what's the name you can give her a shout yeah, yeah <laughs> I don't I, oh se llama um, Canan honey shop but it's right in front yeah. of the police station um, where the pharmacy is. Well, that lady, I did a logo for them back in the days. And um, she was like, um, you know, do you want some honey or something? And I was like, yeah, you know, let me get some. And she's like, have you tried Royal Jelly? And I was like, no. And she's like, you should really try this. It's really powerful stuff. And I'm like, maybe I will one day. So I went to my car and I looked it up. And I was like, oh, shit, Royal Jelly has a lot of benefits, you know. And so I went back and I was like, yeah, let me have one of those. So I took one. And um. Man, that thing is really powerful. <laughs> like, yeah. you're supposed to take it in the morning, like, um, after you fast, you know, you haven't eaten nothing, and you put it under your tongue, half of a teaspoon, like, un half, just a little tiny thing under your, your tongue so that it goes right into your blood system. And it's, like, packed with vitamin B plus and things like that. Just, I don't know what else, but it's it's just really healthy shit. <laughs> <laughs> And um, just that like made me feel so good that after doing that for two days that I went to go like try a beer and the beer didn't feel good to my body. Like it reject. It was like my body was rejecting the alcohol. And then, uh, you know, and then I stopped drinking like it was it was around that time when I stopped drinking for a lot of other reasons. And then uh, I went back um, a month later whenever I finished it to go get another one. It takes like a whole month to finish it. And um, the lady said, ¿Te gustó? And I said, yeah. And then, then she said, Osta también ayuda, you know, it helps you to stop drinking alcohol. And I was like, you're kidding me. I didn't know that. Yeah. But I've been sober since you sold me that. So yeah. that was part of what helped. Like, it just put me in a, like, I don't know. It just feels, it feels so good that you don't want to fuck it up with other shit. But it doesn't work for everybody. You know, like, it um, it did something to me that uh, that other people... Like I've told, and they're like, nah, didn't do it for me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they just, just like that. Have a beer, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for the honey or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll just have a beer. I'm cool. But for me, it really did affect my taste buds, and it really, like, it really rejected alcohol. So, but I mean, I stopped drinking for a lot of reasons, you know, especially like just my health. My health was like pretty fucked up back then. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you, you were, you were going hard back then. Huh? And it was, it, yeah. it's funny because like I, I was around you back then and it was, uh, people never thought you had a problem because you were never <laughs> drama, you were funny, you were just start like smiling, always, you're like the life of the party. And so yeah. people were like, oh yeah, like he's not a problem, like he doesn't have a drinking yeah. problem, it's just, uh, yeah, but it was the health thing that. Yeah, uh, but I mean there was people who's like, whose house I would wake up every morning, you know, the that's like a problem after a while, you know, like, fuck. Yeah, you didn't do that at my again. place. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, not everybody saw how many nights I would, you know, drink a lot, you know. So, especially after I wasn't living at home anymore, so. Ah. The whole it's night. a long story, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. So, um, I was going to ask about, I wanted to ask about Slow Rider. Um, you know, some of the... A lot of like the younger heads here in, in Boyle Heights, you know, some of them, some of them do know about Slow Rider and that you were in it. Um, but some of the younger folks here, they, they might have heard of Slow Rider, but they have no idea that yeah. that you, like Rafa, the photographer, was <laughs> was uh, one of the singers at one point, right? Back in the days when I was young. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wasn't even that young, but <laughs> yeah, I used to write rhymes, you know, since I was um, a kid and I was always, you know, 
I was I was in a hip hop since it began. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like literally from well, not from the get get because I wasn't in New York, but you know, the first song that we heard on the West Coast was uh, you know, the um fucking uh, Sugar Hill <laughs> Yeah, Sugar Hill gang and all that. So yeah. I have the memory of when I first heard that song and I listened to it over and over and I was I would always trip out on that line about chicken tastes like wood and it would make me laugh, you know. <laughs> I was just tripping on that. So <clears throat> back then, nobody listened to hip hop, but I gravitated towards it. And um, I was like the first one on my block, you know, uh, that started to listen to it and really like get into it. And in my middle school, there was only a small group of people that would listen to it, you know, and then, you know, then you started hanging around with graffiti artists and all that. But um, so I always wrote rhymes and I always kind of like did my own thing. And I just rap with my family or with friends, you know, nothing like we tried to do a hip hop group once called the Kings Rockers, like back in the days. The Kings Rockers, the big bass droppers, but <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, it was me and DJ Desmo, my homeboy. Um, we would, uh, do some parties. We did, we, you know, did a couple of like, um, rapping contests and shit like that. We were pretty cool. <laughs> we were all right. But, um, when, um, uh, when Slow Rider came around, like, I, I didn't used to go to, like, gigs. I didn't used to go to music stuff. I didn't used to do anything like that. I was the kind of kid that just grew up on my block. And one day, a friend of mine invited me to go check out some music. I was hanging out with some people. And I was like, yeah, let's go. And we went to um, Old Town Pasadena and a place called the Old Town Pub. Slow Rider was on stage, and I knew the guitar player because of theater at ELEC. And uh, he knew that I rapped. And Slow Rider was... Uh, strictly instrumental band they didn't have anybody on the mic and there was a mic stand there and my homeboy carlos he was jamming out on the guitar with the wow wow pedal because that's what he did <laughs> and uh he gestured to me with you know with the, with the george lopez nod like hey what's up you know and then he was like nodding for him for me to come over to the mic like he pointed at the mic because he knew i was a rapper and i was like nah and he was like come on so I did. I went up and I did like two songs just on top of their instrumental stuff. And um, at the end of that day, like, you know, at the end of the, the show, we were all kicking it, hanging around, having some beers. And they're like, why don't you come to our practice this week? So two weeks later, I'm opening up for Oza Motley, you know, <laughs> so wow. it was like it just happened like that. And then two weeks after that, they were already recording. So they were already like planning to record all these things were already in motion and i just came in like right at the right time and was able to do their first um ep you know? wow yeah so yeah i mean that happened for it worked it worked for a little while i toured with them a little bit had a lot of fun it was really like some of the funnest like times that i've ever had um with those guys and and being on stage is uh it's pretty awesome it's pretty cool and uh when i did my first photo show I remember um, thinking like everything that I did before that, like theater and the music yeah. and all that, I was on stage and I never got to see my work. You know, <laughs> it was yeah. kind of like other people would see my work. I would be the work. People would come to me. But when I did my first photography show and I hung it up um, and I sat back and I was like, oh, wow. Like now I get to be also like an observer, you know? So anyways, it was like a, it was a switch from being like, being um observed to also observing does that make any sense yeah no that's that's awesome you know i i forgot a i had forgotten about your theater like so you you've done you've done it all man like from music theater now you're doing photography uh and you've always it's kind of excelled at, at it all it seems man so well i always yeah. say that i'm i'm the mediocre guy that just has enough talent to do it but <laughs> not 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 super talent to like get you know get past i remember telling david gomez once that i was gonna do a, a solo album called mediocre <laughs> you know <laughs> that's what i always feel about me like my shit's mediocre but i just work like crazy so yeah just make it look all right dude. <laughs> yeah you have to work really hard you know harder than somebody that has like it's supernatural talent, yeah. talent yeah i mean we, we're lucky we have certain gifts but like um you know sometimes it's it's fucking hard you know it's yeah. hard to put it all together sometimes and and we get lucky when we do but it's it's i mean yeah, I know how hard you work because I've been here and I've seen <laughs> you work and, and people don't see that, you know, not a lot of people see that. And uh, yeah, it takes a lot of your time, a lot of your life. You really have to, you know, 
you, you do have to put other things aside and it sucks sometimes, but <laughs> it really does suck. Yeah. But you have to, you know, you have to keep working. And yeah, it's that, like the, my, I call the it the addiction, important. you know, yeah. that, that, that's like a, exactly. so, it's like a, an addiction that just kind of gives positive fruits. And sometimes you get to miss out on stuff, you know, I'm yeah. like, man, I, I didn't go to, oh, yeah. you know, I was telling the lot of yesterday, like I didn't go to my, one of my cousins, the only cousin of my of my generation that's gotten married, I didn't make it to her party wow. because I, I had to work. I, I had like to finish the pieces for Espejismo, you know, and, yeah. and like I just I get bummed out when I think about it. But I'm like, you know, yeah. I just it is what it is now. But I felt bad. Um, but yeah, no, I, I was there's a couple other things I wanted to ask. You know, the, the funny thing to me is that. um. Just being like, uh, you're probably one of the original like Chicano nerds, you know, you're like, a th <laughs> you're a theater dude, you're like geeking out on a bunch of stuff, but you're like, you're like from the hood, you know, so yeah. it's like, uh, it's one of the things that I always kind of find interesting of the way that, you know, whether it's media or even just like, like websites like Me Too, how they try to, it's like they, they try to pin like, uh, p what is it called, uh, uh, pigeonhole, like mm. Rasa into certain categories, yeah. right, where like, you know, the cholo, the this, the that, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and, and, you know, I think I've always, I have, a, I always know that Rasa is very complex, right? And yeah. that we have different influences of a lot of different things, but it's, it's, um, I was like, man, I, I've always kind of identified as a geek, you know, like from, yeah. from like El Centro, from like, you know, a Mexican <laughs> neighborhood. And then that's why a lot of my friends are like, they're geeks, like, you know, you, Juan, uh, you know, all, yeah. all my friends, but they're from, Mexican neighborhoods that have like, you know, they're kind of rough around the edges, you know, yeah, that's funny. but, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I, how, how did you get into theater? Cause that's, that's hardcore geeky shit. Man. <laughs> First of all, like, I'm glad that you said that I'm like the coolest Chicano nerd. Cause, uh, when I was, or I don't even know if you said the coolest, but when the I was the original, when, no, original. All right. Cause when I was young, it was just nerd. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You weren't cool. Yeah. No, then. there was nothing cool about it. You know, I, I don't think I was a cool kid at all. And, um, you know, but I try to be cool, you know, I got hip hop and this and that, but I don't know. I was never like the super cool guys, you know, um, it was, that was a whole nother club. Yeah. And I mean, I was part of like the gifted program. So, you know, that gives you another nerd level, you yeah. know, and then I was always broke. So I never had cool clothes. So that's another, <laughs> that's another nerd level. I never had the cool shoes, shoes. I never, I mean, I had like some, some Nikes and some adidas but i never had like the fucking sick ass clothes at all so a lot i i never had the cool car you know yeah. i had i never had the mustang i had the mustang 2 look it up look it up there I was a car called a mustang 2 and it's embarrassing so i didn't even have the pino it's I had like the, a fiero <laughs> something like that i didn't even have the pino i had the fake pino which was a mercury bobcat so like nothing cool, you know, but, um, whatever I made it, <laughs> made it through those days and, you know, uh, got my ass kicked a few times or made fun <laughs> of, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we did grow up in the streets back then. Like everything we did was in the streets. We were always in the streets. We, we didn't stay inside the house. You came home just to put your stuff away and go out in the streets, you know, and then you'd come back and when the lights turn off, like, like, um, Some little rascals like, over here. Yeah. Like Warren G said, you know, until the lights come off and then you go home and, that's what we used to do all the time. So we did, you know, as we got older and shit happened in the neighborhood and you saw people die and, and people pass away and, and shit like that, it does make you hard around the edges. So by the time, you know, I got older and you grow goatee and your face, you know, gives you more like a uh, character, um, people see you different, but they don't understand how much of a nerd you are. You know, like yeah. it's a total fucking nerd. Um, yeah. And I always did theater. You know, I, I actually did theater since I was a little kid. Um, I, I never went to like theater classes as, as a little kid, but um, we did. We went to like uh, this Hollywood camp um, with with our sixth grade class and they did a skit. And the skit that I did, they loved so much that they have they had us perform it back at the school for the school. And you wrote the skit? No, no, no. Oh, they, okay. Somebody else wrote it, but they loved it. What we learned at the theater camp. So they had us do it like in a in front of the entire class, you know, so in front of the entire like sixth grade class, you know what I mean? That's awesome. So we did that. And then at the boys and girls club, <laughs> I was super fucking skinny. I was skinny. They used to call me Skeletor, <laughs> but they needed somebody to play Santa Claus in a play. And I played Santa Claus <laughs> with with a pillow and one of those disco belts that yeah. the women used to wear back then. 
So, I mean, I did that, and, and when people saw that, they were like, wow, you know, you're the only person on stage that projected this and that. So I thought about it for a while, and when I got to middle school and there was a drama club, I joined drama club, and I did some plays, I did some theater with them in um, ninth grade, and then went on to high school, and, and I took some drama classes in high school, but I wasn't really present in high school. It wasn't I, until I went to East LA College that I really um, started taking the drama seriously, oh, wow. and then did... Did some really good shows and read a lot of theater. Reading theater is as fun as doing it sometimes. And I did um did a couple of pro shows and did a, a show that toured you know to Europe and did a couple of short films and all that before I got into music. So it was a really good time. I mean, theater sucks your life though. I mean, you were talking about like not being able to be at places. You have to rehearse almost every day of the week before um, your show comes up, and then when when your show come, when your show actually opens, you do have more time. But there's like months where you're rehearsing you every keep day. Keep your head in the game, though, right? Yeah, and you miss everything. When I was in theater, I missed everything that my family did. So from theater to jumping in a band and going, you know, places, I missed a lot of family events. I mean, a real lot of family events, like people growing up, people getting married, quinceañeras, you know, kids, birthdays, everything. You know, I missed a lot of things. Um, it wasn't until after all that, like, kind of, like, settled down that that I, you know, like, right now, I have a really good family life, you know, like, with our family, we're all really connected. I mean, we're not, we, we all live in different cities within Southern California, but we see each other frequently, and, you know, we good. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, yeah, that was a huge period of time where you're just involved with so much art stuff that you can't be anywhere, you know, you just can't. It's one of those, like things that you suffer for i guess yeah no that's that's i definitely feel you on that um yeah that you're making me laugh with the with the cool clothing you know i i would always uh there was this when i was a kid at like mervin's they would have this uh brand called like uh rolling hard and they have like the you remember that <laughs> no. it was like it would be like a, oh yeah the drawings with, yeah. With, with like a uh six four impala yeah, or yeah, something yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then they would be, they have like, like an like awesome. jail drawings kind yeah, of. Yeah, straight yeah, up jail yeah, drawings. And yeah, I yeah. thought they were the dopest things. And yeah. there's this, there a couple kids at school that would wear them. And I thought they, it was like the coolest <laughs> shit. But my mom was like, No te voy a dejar que te pongas eso. No quiero que eres cholo. <laughs> and then she would make me wear a uh, gecko, which I thought was oh, tight. You know? that's funny, but man. it was like, I had to wear all like the server stuff, yeah. you know, because <laughs> it was safe, you know. But it was. Uh, and I still never to this, like I've never worn one of those shirts. I'm like I've already kind of passed the you gotta time. Get one of those for your birthday. Yeah, dude, I'll just so. hang out on the wall for <laughs> nostalgia. Frame I can't it, frame it. I've, I've gone too too far That's as a nerd. Funny. I can't I can't go yeah, into yeah. that direction. But yeah, that, that made me laugh. Um, yeah, man. So um, what do you think of uh, what? what do you, are you gonna continue shooting or what, what? You know, what are you thinking about working on next as far as photo wise? Well, I'm, I'm still shooting, and right now I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to, um, you know, level up is what I keep telling myself, those, those words, level up. Trying to find another level of artistry that I haven't attained yet, you know what I mean? Because it's part of the challenge, and part of what keeps you doing the work that we do is, is discovering new stuff, right? At least that's what I think, you know, like, like, um, I mean, sometimes you you discover another layer layer or level and you can play in that level for a while i don't even know how to explain it that would be more clearer but i'm trying to find another level <laughs> yeah no i feel i mean i understand um you know that was kind of how when you started shooting you did the one like a photo a day mm -hmm. for a year right mm -hmm. um and that i mean that kind of you can see your progression from the beginning to the end, you yeah. think, right? And and I think totally maybe doing some other kind of crazy challenge like that, you know? Yeah. So I don't I know. I mean, I don't think I would do that again, <laughs> but maybe I'll do like another series like I did last year, like just the summer, you know what I mean? So like just smaller periods, but not a whole year. Um, I could do a whole year if it would be like funded, <laughs> but yeah. now, n now I can't, I can't take like that much time, you know? And it's hard to, I've tried just saying, well, I'll do it, but, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to find that one image because back in the days when I first started, nobody was, um, I was not that anybody's judging me now, but nobody was, you know, judging me. It was just like, I'm going to shoot at anything and post anything. Sometimes I would just post a picture of my hand, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And sometimes I would just post a picture of <clears throat> something that I found on the wall or something, you know, it, and it was, 
the reason why I started it was so that I could shoot every day to get used to my camera. I wanted to learn the camera a lot better. I wanted to I wanted it to become second nature. So it really didn't matter what I was shooting on some days. But now there's there's um more people looking at my website, looking at my posts, and I think that I can't do that anymore. It's a little pressure <laughs> now. Yeah. I can't just like shoot my feet because I even did like one photo of my feet <laughs> and just yeah. posted it up. Yeah. Um, you know, but in the 365 days, there's some jewels in there, you know, that, yeah. that I was able to find. But yeah, it's not it's not the same right now. And <clears throat> and um, if I did it, I'd have to go out every day and shoot, you know, like four hours to find something, you know. And uh, it's really hard to make that time nowadays to just, you know, set that much time aside every single day. So, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do more, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say portraits or, or I just want to, I don't know. I'm trying to do something different. I, I'll, I guess we'll see where it goes, you know, but I'm yeah. also trying to do video. So I'm, I'm lucky enough that I have some projects coming up where I'm going to be able to test my, my, my video. I've shot some videos in the past, but kind of like mm, quick and, and guerrilla style. But now I'm actually going to sit down and try to get some actual cinematic stuff going on so fingers crossed it's fucking hard yeah. to do movies it's fucking hard to write something it's hard enough to write it but then to interpret it through video and to hit all the marks that you imagine with other people so it's not yeah. like you doing it <clears throat> it's like you have to get person a and person b to do the words that you wrote how you imagined the them. whole orchestra <laughs> yeah. and you have to get somebody else to hold the camera and you want that camera to be pointed exactly where you imagine and there's um you know there's some people that are pretty awesome at it and of course i mean there's some people that are geniuses at it but i mean locally there's some people that are really kicking ass and i'm lucky enough to know some people that um can help me um learn and and you know that's the other thing too like i say i'm self-taught but I've learned a lot from people around me, you know, like like um, Juan Luis Garcia, our homeboy, like Rick Mendoza, the first guy that sold me a camera, and like Noe Montes is always extremely helpful. And there's other people out there like Sam Coleman and Jeff Newton too that that um, if I have a question, they'll be like, "Boom, here you yeah, go." Yeah, yeah, like yeah. they're super, super giving and 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 um, approachable. So. I appreciate like everybody that has helped me with tiny little things, you know, throughout the way. Um, it's just, it's cool to have people like that around you. And at the same time to have that kind of relationship with folks that, um, that they, that they um, are willing to share so much with you, you know? Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's, you know, for younger artists that are listening, you know, if, if anyone is going to be listening to the first one, but you know, I'm sure a lot, Rafa's going to bring a lot of people. Um, one of the things that I think is, is very important is having like that network of artists that uh, of other folks that are going to support you, you know, like for me, that was main thing. Cause I came, I came to LA, uh, 2006, I was 19 and you know, Juan Garcia had my back, you know, I was working with Shepard. He had my back. I started working with Richard Duardo with, with, uh, you know, he, he passed away, uh, with B plus and they, they were all my mentors. And then now it's like, I, I'm, I, I haven't started mentoring people, but there's younger people that work with me, you know, that assist me. And then, you know, I try to help, you know, it, it, you just kind of, it's like almost like the pay it forward thing, you know, mm. that I, people had my back so much early on that I feel like, like I'm part of that. I have to like you have to keep on like that yeah. karmic energy. You just gotta keep doing it. And and I feel like uh, you know sometimes as artists we get we isolate ourselves and kind of go away and in, into our caves. But it's very important. Like you're saying, you know, you got Noé, you got you know Juan and Newton and all these guys. Like you know, I got m a bunch of people that got my mm. back. What and it's different for different things. You know, like yeah. I got my friends that are like the comedy guys, like yeah. the hip hop <laughs> world. The yeah. art world, the politics. And then and we have amazing people like Yvonne Gallardo, oh man. And Betty Avila, Joel Garcia that help us with um, a different kind of, you know. Yeah, the admin side of yeah, things. Yeah, the admin yeah. side of things. They help us, you know, they help us apply for grants. They help us with whatever we need. And I also have <laughs> Tanya that helps me. Tanya Diaz helps me with all that stuff. So it's, it's, it's a team of people that 
support that us, support yeah. you yeah and um yeah just build relationships and 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 be be the same with those people back when they need something you know exactly, always you yeah. know try to be there when you can and and people will people will help you know people will help yeah it's funny i, I text at least i text Joel at least once a week i'm like <laughs> who could who, who could come to my studio right now and like you know uh, mop the floors and then connect stencils or whatever. Yeah. And someone's he's like this this girl you know yeah, yeah. And Melissa will show up or someone. You know? <laughs> but it's uh no yeah that's that's one of the things that I really you know that's one of the things that I really dig about being here in Boyle Heights. We have a lot of artists. You have a lot of you know raza. It's, it feels very comfortable to be in, in an environment very similar to how you know we grew up. And and um, I mean you're you're not too far from from where, where you're origi- you're from you know. Yeah. But for me it's like I'm from the Centro and then Boyle Heights seems like the, it's pretty it, it's, it's close yeah, yeah yeah you know and um um what was gonna ask there's a couple i keep on thinking if i have to get like a little notepad and yeah every yeah. time i think of something i'm gonna but yeah no, you're I, supposed I, to take the notes before the show but it's all good yeah no i, I kind of wanted to do <laughs> we're it. winging this one we're winging I think this I'm gonna one wing them all, yeah. though, because I oh love, that's cool i think it could well, be like uh with craig ferguson where they'd give him the notes and he'd just rip them up and throw them away exactly <laughs> so. well i like what I, where things go when you don't have things planned you know yeah. like i just i like going into like the rabbit hole if you will yeah. you know and, and and uh and i feel like if if i have a bunch of notes i'm gonna try to hit everything because it's just me like I, i'm yeah. trying to be like ocd about everything <laughs> but um i was like no notes i'm just gonna go in there and like make it happen but yeah. i mean i, I it's crazy because I've, I've heard so many like you told me some crazy stories about you know everything um and so but i i'm like did we already i, I forget if we already just covered it or no, not you know we haven't but, covered um, anything really. yeah the uh one of the things that, that that like i enjoy you know your friendship a lot is you know when when you tell me you know you got to watch this film and you're not just like watch this film it's dope you're like you got to watch it because of the way that you know the historical context of it like the political undertones the the way that the, the, the lighting was set up the way that the director thought of everything and you're just like your reviews are like so on point where I'm like man I, I'm gonna go watch that shit tonight you know and then and and uh and I was like man I, like Rafa's gotta have like some movie review shit like where yeah. the, it, for other like nerdy Chicanos and shit but <laughs> it's um I I can't wait for to to see you know your video stuff because like you've uh. been kind of dissecting a, a, a videos and movies and you know pretty much any kind of visual arts and and music as well you've been kind of the way that you dissect it and you give me these really like in-depth reviews i'm like man i can't i can't wait to see what because yeah. you you got your attention to detail is like insane man i don't know it's gonna I, I, be a, i think i'm i think i don't have a lot of attention to detail i think i'm more like bruto you know just like ah just do it and like you know um but but I think it's more than you think. You give I, yourself credit. I yeah. know what you're saying. Um, like when I look at something and I see all the details, but like when I'm working, I'm like I'm the guy that forgets details. So I need somebody else to remind me of those little details. But I mean, having seen all these movies is nothing until you try to shoot. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's fucking tough, man. I mean, you could you could stand in in a hundred museums, look at paintings, and doesn't mean you're gonna be able to paint something, you know. So so mm-hmm. I mean, it's a really it's a long shot, you know, it, it, and, and, and I'm saying this because I've tried to shoot a few things and, and it's hard, it's fucking hard to like get it right, to, to get your vision right. It's hard. Um, but you know, fingers crossed and, um, through trial and error, you know, let's fail a few times till we get it right. Um, you know, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. I mean, I might fuck up a few waste a couple months on something but i'm hoping that at the end of all this i'm going to be able to come out with um a style or something that's mine you know something that because i want to be able to to look to show a film where people go oh like oh that's rafa rafa shot that you know that's obviously his style that's like so i want to be able to develop that with the with the video visuals so fingers crossed yeah earlier you were saying how um when you were in high school you didn't you kind of like you kind of dropped out a little bit of like mm. you just weren't there what, what were you up to if you want to share some of that I was, <laughs> the mishaps in the, in the late 80s it was ditching party like season for years and ditching parties were the norm 
like every day during the day during the day people <laughs> didn't go to school and you'd find a place to go party and a lot of people did sometimes just four people sometimes just two people sometimes a house full of people sometimes the cops would come sometimes people is that what you're telling me that the, the guys at uh at metal shop would put grease on the fence is that oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> at roosevelt high school if you go to roosevelt um where the auto shop is there was a fence that we would always jump over because it had it had a, a just a pole across the top, so it didn't have the spikes. It was yeah. easy to just. It was a get, chain link, right? Yeah. yeah, it was a chain link fence, but at the top was a pole, so it was easy to just flip over it. But the guys from the auto shop there, one day they decided to put grease all along the top of that shit. So everybody that tried to leave that day would get grease all over their fucking clothes, and they ruined a lot of people's clothes. But I'm sure they had a good time laughing at everybody. But ditching parties were the norm. People would just stay home and drink 40s and, and, you know. I mean, it really ruined my high school completely. Like, completely ruined my high school. And both of my parents worked, so we had a lot of people at our house all the time. And my sisters were older, and they'd have, you know, ditching parties too. And so it was just, <laughs> it was, yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of went downhill from, <laughs> like, 10th grade to senior year. You don't, do you regret it, or you, um, it's part no, of who you, you are? No, you know what? Right? I don't regret it because... Uh, I wasn't really learning anything in high school, to be <laughs> honest. Like, I don't mean to be like, I don't know. I was bored with high school. And, and when I got to my senior year, um, they called me in. I was like, I started at Roosevelt, but I ended up at Garfield. And when the first day of my senior year, like the first class, first day of senior year, I get called into the counseling office. And they're like, Rafael, you're not going to graduate this year. Even if you go to night school, even if you take extra period, even if you like, you don't have enough credits, like you haven't, you haven't been here. And I was like, well, what can I do? Cause I don't want to be another year. I said, the only thing you can do is go to continuation, you know, go here and, um, you know, they'll help you finish this year and get your GED or whatever. So I went and uh, they give you contracts. Like it's like homeschooling, but they give you a contract for like 10th grade English. 11th grade English, 12th grade, you know, all these things. And you basically like read and then you take a test at the end of each one. Well, I finished my entire high school in six months. Wow. So I finished three years of high school <laughs> in six months and I was like, I'm done. I can go there. Like, wait, you're not even 18 yet. <laughs> so I had to wait because I wasn't 18. I still had to go to continuation for six more months and just take like electives. But I pretty much finished everything. And I started, you know, tutoring other people and stuff like that. But that's what happened to my high school career. So it was like Roosevelt, Garfield, East LA Skill Center, graduate. So when you you were saying you were like in the in the gifted program, like when you were younger, you had really good grades, and yeah, that kind of happened to me because I used to have I used to be like an honor roll and all that stuff. You know, I'd always, you know, three point whatever eight to four point zero, and sometimes even four point one when I had Damn. APs, I and then I just took a dive you know i got politicized like i was listening to too much like rage and too much <laughs> theaters and public enemy and then i started trying to like it would bug me out like the same way that i tell you like sometimes when i watch movies and there's no people of color in it yeah. it just like i'm like this is a this is not reality like i look outside yeah. and there's people of color like and i and i hate that from films and sometimes i still watch stuff like you know i was watching better call sal earlier and yeah. you know there's not a lot of uh uh, a POC in there. I mean, there yeah. is the bad guys. Now, but <laughs> it's, uh, That's I love right. that show though, but you know, it's, um, it, I, I kind of just dropped out for those reasons, like mentally, you know, and I, and I ended up graduating, but I wasn't, I, I, I barely got by, but it was, I don't know. I always, I always tell people, you know, kids will ask me like, or parents will be like, you know, is it like, tell my kids about like stay in school and like kick yeah. ass and I'm just kind of like no I just I, I don't want to tell them that I want them to be individuals and question shit and like if they're yeah. gonna fuck up fuck up on your own terms and, yeah. and then you you come and, and like you know correct your own kind of yeah, mishaps exactly, on your yeah. own but I don't know it just, it's just to me it's always a, it's healthy to question society constantly right it's like I don't know I, I had a meeting today with some folks from from the teachers union in LA and they were saying how like you know a lot of youth of color are they go through the through the school system and they're, they're just disenfranchised yeah. you know and they, they don't feel like people don't speak to to who they are as like you know yeah, whatever they race they are yeah. with a community you know but yeah no I, I, I that's when you start to that. like hate everything and you start to like not want to be a part of everything exactly. and you start to yeah i mean that and to me what happened was i got an f in in a ninth like near the end of my ninth grade and i got an f and i that i 
I didn't think I deserved. And from that point on, I was like, fuck you. Like I was, it was really like passive aggressiveness, you know, like I'm not going to go to school. How about that? (laughs) But it was also the alcohol. I mean, like we, we were like my family is fucking, we used to drink all the time since we were kids. You know, I tell people when they tell me why did I stop drinking? I'm like, I started drinking in the seventh grade, like started drinking in seventh grade. Like hard. Yeah. It wasn't like I had to be, you had like hangovers in seventh grade. Like we were drinking all the time. We, we did a lot. And and I remember hanging out with my friends. We'd get 12 packs, you know, we were, we were kids. Like beer runs and stuff. Yeah. We were doing beer runs and all kinds of shit, but it's, you know, it, it just got to a point where I had to just stop all that. But I don't know. I forgot where I was going with that. Are you about this kids being disenfranchised? Yeah, well, yeah. So I just started to like, you know, just like not like high school, not like, I don't know. I started to just like not want to be around it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And at what age, like when you were already older, you were saying you got into, you got into theater. Like, what was it you were starting to kind of be like one want, wanting to be creative? Like, was it something you just kind of did for fun or was it something that was just kind of burning inside of you? You needed to, yeah. Like as soon as I, as soon as I got my, um, as soon as I got my high school diploma, I went to a business school. <clears throat> it was before I even went to East LA college. I went to a business. I was, you know, my mind was like, I'm going to get a job and I'm going to be a part of the working world. You know, I also be, had been working since I was like 12 in different little tiny jobs. But I was like, I'm going to be part of the working world. And I, I got my, um, I was, a, uh, I got a certificate in paralegalism, yeah. which was also kind of like one of those business schools that was shitty that charges you <laughs> a gazillion dollars. And you're like, here's your diploma, you know, <laughs> but what I really learned was how to be a secretary. And, <laughs> and, and I started working in law offices and all these little things, but I thought that was going to be my life. But little by little arts would like, you know, like pull me and pull me and pull me and then yeah. so I would like oh let me try theater well let me try this so so but I was always doing it for fun you know I always like you know my hobby or whatever but when I think of it now I have stronger memories of all that than I do of school than I do of you know like like whenever I got involved in theater and and what I gave to theater and what I gave to being in that band like of myself is is a lot more than what I gave to try to get my diploma and all that. Do you know what I mean? Like I I was really, um, like, I gave. <laughs> I mean, I was really like invested in 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 like art and stuff. And little by little, like all this other like working world stuff like fell off, and and like the world just kind of like pushed me towards art. I think. I mean, that's the way I visualize. That's the way I see it. And. You know, some people are like, ah, you just didn't like working. No, I didn't. That's true. <laughs> like, I'm, I didn't I'm like with you. I didn't like the structure is what I didn't like. I love working. You've seen me work, too. Yeah, of course. We work fucking hard. And then but it's the structure of like the nine to five, the yeah. offices and all that. You know, it's changing just now. Working under like dickheads. And shit. Yeah, yeah, it's changing now. And some people have different structures and, and, and um, you know, they don't try to be so like like strict hierarchies and shit People are like they, they let you bring your dog to work now yeah you can bring your dog to work and you, you can take a nap at work you know it's different uh you, you get a stress card you know i'm i'm stressed can i take a break yeah go ahead you know. <laughs> shit like that that they didn't have where, back where, then where did they do that i didn't hear that <laughs> that's actually in the marines oh for real uh, stress card yeah you could like pull out your stress card uh Damn, it, i want like a hundred of those yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like i'm too stressed i need to step aside I don't know if they still do that, but they did it for a while. My brother told me. Did he ever use his stress card? No, they did it after he left. Oh, yeah. So he was like talking shit about them. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I mean, the working culture, corporate culture is different. Like everybody's trying to be a lot more friendly. Everybody's trying to be a lot more forgiving. Yeah. You know, than what it was when I was working. When it was I was working, ruthless. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just you know, and and every time you work under somebody that's giving like authority to be your boss. You know, they can be jerks. I don't know, whatever. I just didn't like working and all that. And and I got to a point where I decided I'm going to work for myself. And working for myself has really been how I've been able to, like, just really be myself. Exactly. You know, because, yeah. like, having to work in these other jobs and having to wear a tie every day, like, even, like, um, at my dad's funeral, rest in peace, my papa, um, my, my, my mom was like, mijo, no te quieres poner una corbata. And I was like, I told myself, Mom, I'm never going to wear a tie again. <laughs> it's like nothing against the family. And she's like, okay, let's go get a, a nice um, 
bow tie? <laughs> no, I got a, I just got a brand new way of it. I, you know, oh, nice. Let me get away. Looking like a Chicano stuff. study yeah. professor. <laughs> <laughs> looking like looking like a waiter <laughs> at a fancy Mexican restaurant. Yeah. That's what somebody told us. Aren't those waiter shirts? <laughs> no. But yeah, I, it's just like I'm never going to wear a tie again, you know. Maybe I will one day if I want to. But I just decided, like, I'm never going to wear a tie. And that's why I wear shorts a I bet lot, you too. someone's lis- like, listening, like, I'm going to make this motherfucker wear a tie. Yeah. <laughs> Juan's probably one of them. And shit. Yeah. But, yeah, no, that's, uh, no, just he's going to Photoshop one on you. Yeah. The, uh, you know, right now what you're saying is how, you know, the regular working world, a lot of times it just, you know, I was kind of repelled by it. I, I didn't like it um, because... I feel like a lot anything that's just going in and working and it's a grind. You never really you, you it just it's set up where you never really get to know yourself because you don't need to explore who you are. You mm. know, and being artists, like yeah. we constantly gotta be digging within ourselves yeah. and like and then when we're digging, we find like the the broken parts yeah. of ourselves and you want to fix that. And sometimes you know, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But it, it, in it's always kind of like. Uh, like being an artist and constantly looking in, there's like something healthy about it. I mean, it's, it's a hard, it's a different kind of life. Like some people, you know, they end up self medicating and, you know, yeah. doing other stuff to try to, to try to figure out how to, yeah. how to numb it out. But for, for me and, you know, and, and you as well, you know, we try to, you know, do something right with that information and try to stay healthy, you know, that's actually one of the things that helped me like stay off drinking was what I'm doing, you know, because I'm, because drinking was that it was it was self-medicating it was a mask you know it was like it was it was a lot of that and and um, when I realized that and I decided to like, get rid of it so I didn't have to like wear the party boy mask you know like yeah. I'm 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 the party boy let's go get drink ah, you know let's go get drinks and you know have a good time and and then the cigarette was a, like a second mask <laughs> that you hid behind all the time and you know I was able to get rid of that but but yeah now it's just like it's just me and i like a lot of this like what we're doing here is is um what i tell people all the time because i have coffee with people all the time and and the one-on-one conversations are what i really appreciate now and it's what really helps me not just get to know me but also get to know the people that i'm talking to because i had to change my whole social lifestyle um after i stopped drinking from being at a party and you know you'd you'd go somewhere with 10 people but you'd really just be like hey what's up hey you want a beer ah this fucker ah that guy oh let's talk (laughs) you know you never really had a conversation so after like not drinking and and slowly like coming out to like see people again it took me a while to um start talking and and like really sitting down with people and talking one-on-ones is what helped me a lot just having open discussions and and I don't know. It doesn't even have to be like deep, but just having one on ones really gets like to a, a better place for both people. I think. Yeah, no. I mean, for me, I, that's one of the, my favorite. That's why I wanted to d- do this podcast. Like, one of my favorite things is having conversations. Whether it's just like, you know, one of the things about me, like I don't know if people know, is that I don't really I have a I have trouble reading. You know, I have trouble retaining information, um, and then. You know, a lot of the information I get, whether it's, you know, historical knowledge or, you know, politics, it's either, you know, I talk to my mentor almost, you know, I used to talk to him almost every day lately. I've been so busy. It's been like once a week, but there's different people that I connect that like fill me in on certain stuff. You know, even like my best friend Picasso, you know, we go like when I'm, I'm a fan of boxing and, and UFC, but, you know, I, I kind of like, you know poke my head in and in and out of it because I'm always working. Like he's the one that kind of keeps me up to speed. And then we, you know, it's always very stimulating conversations, even if it's about <laughs> sports or about, you know, very violent uh, fighting, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, I have different friends that I go through, like, you know, <laughs> for different conversations. I go and bullshit yeah. over here. I go and talk to my friends about comedy. And then I got friends that I talk about art or, you know, even just like life stuff that I'm constantly always going through life stuff. And, and I mean, we all are. Yeah. And um, but yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, I've been wanting to make art about conversation, about storytelling, oh, because it's it's always yeah. I think it's, you know, part of our roots, you know, something even from indigenous. Uh, Word. Yeah. You know, for in, in indigenous knowledge or traditions, you know, telling stories was uh, it was a big part of, of uh, who we were as people, you know, or, or at least on our indigenous side. Um, 
and even the way that like you know there's i've heard a lot of these cool stories of like how the only time that like native people ever really drank you know this is pre pre uh pre uh, anheuser bush yeah pre pre colonization <laughs> what was when uh the elders they would be around the young people and they would they would drink like you know some kind of like moonshine or something mm. um to let go of all the stories oh so they, shit. Could, they just kind of ramble and no go way. off and then the young the young kids they would you know learn yeah. and then and then eventually when they became elders they would be able to drink the 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 whatever kind of alcohol like fermented uh corn drink it was and then be able to you know pass those uh that's funny that's but that good. was the only time it was really allowed you know yeah. and, and now you know i get stressed out and i go get a beer you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh yeah need to decolonize that i guess <laughs> yeah I, I had a lot of times like when i was drinking where i would just sit at a bar and like people would just like come and talk to me you know like just like oh, yeah. i would hear a lot of like therapy <laughs> sessions i guess oh yeah <laughs> you know? A lot of lot of stuff like that. So yeah, I mean the alcohol definitely like gets you talking. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and no lies either, right? <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it's strangers, you know, it's like you'd have a lot of really good conversations. Yeah, it's a yeah. trip. What's the weirdest thing you ever you kind of like someone ever told you when you were just out and about getting drunk? I I wouldn't be able to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember those conversations. Yeah. I don't remember at all, but um, I would sit at Spaceland a lot. Um, the Space venue Land, in Silver yeah, Lake. Silver Lake. Um, Florida used to have a, a residency there. We'd play every Wednesday, and and they had a smoking room where you could actually smoke, and the smoke would get ventilated out, and it overlooked the stage, so you could still watch the show. You could still see people watch while you're there. But I'd go and sit at that bar and smoke cigarettes and, and drink beer and, and there would always be somebody to come in and talk to me right there. I just remember that like that place as like the place where I'd be like, damn, why do, why do I always get like this stranger like to come and tell me like this strange story out of yeah. you know, nowhere? That was a cool spot. Cool time in my life. Yeah, that's a trip. My, one of my favorite bars. Uh, I mean, I don't really drink too much. But one of my favorite bars is uh, the King's Head over there in uh in uh santa monica it's mm. right on second street and like and i think santa monica but um the reason why that's one of my favorite places is when i went on a trip when i was 19 to, mm. uh, or i was 20 maybe i was 20 with shepherd uh to london and here I, i've never been in a bar before you know and i, I never really drank and over there i was already you know drinking age is 18 yeah. so i was i got like my first like you know, taste the bars at like pubs and it, and it was in <laughs> London badass. and it was really awesome. Really like nice, but like, like the bartenders, like they're like over there to take a living wage, you know? So you have people that are, their career is bartending. Yeah. And like, you know, I remember one of the bartenders, she looked, she was older. She looked like Sharon Osbourne, you know? <laughs> and she, uh, yeah, she, she, uh, anyways, but I, it was, that was a time where it, it was, uh, the pound was really strong. It was like, two dollars to one pound so i would be like oh seven dollars a, yeah. a beer but it's actually 14 you know <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah like chef gave me a per diem it was like 70 dollars a day but it was really 35 <laughs> but i would like you know be drinking, drinking beers it. and not not all not every day but w that one of the times we were hanging out and um whatever I, I remember just like loving like the bar style so when i came back and i went i turned 21 and i went to uh like a regular bar i'm like this sucks like this yeah. sucks so then when i went to the king's head i'm like ah oh, this is what a bar is yeah. supposed to be like <laughs> so I, I remember one of the times i was uh i was almost gonna graduate right i was gonna finish school where i was going and to finish school you you have to you have to have your portfolio done and like three weeks before it was my last week you know every everyone most of the people in my class they didn't finish their portfolio to the, like the last two days and i got mine done really early so i said i'm gonna just go to the king's head i don't give a fuck let's yeah. go you know so my friend angel went with me and we went there and i had like 30 bucks i'm like we're gonna get like you know two beers each and then we gotta go and we sit down and there was this man there older white dude uh he's probably in his mid to late 50s like he was probably close to 60 really cool dude and he started telling us he's like yeah i've been all over the world and we were hanging out and we kicked it with this dude for like hours <laughs> he got he bought us like nice he I, I i didn't even spend any of my money like the dude bought us like uh probably like six pints each nice. we were slammed and i remember <laughs> i was like i want to go look at the ocean and i was looking at the ocean and i just threw up <laughs> i was i got motion sickness 
But I remember that like <laughs> right <great>. before, <laughs> right before, just looking at the ocean just made me throw up. Yeah. The uh, when I left, like you know, we were hanging out. He's telling you know, yeah, I've been to Saudi Arabia. I've been to like Chile. I've been you know, he, he telling me all these places. I'm like, what does this guy do? You know, I, I wasn't putting two and two. I was drinking. I was having a good time. Secret. And agent. then he's like, at the end, he's like, hey man, if you ever need anything, like if you're ever in a whatever in a bind you hit me up you're cool and he gives me his card and i didn't i just put it in my pocket and then the next day i got um i got i got home you know i was all hung over i th threw up and like i wake up in the morning i like go in my pocket and it's like a halliburton card wow and the dude was like one of the i don't know what he black was ops doing. yeah but he was he was cool as hell. I was like, yeah. I lost the card. I don't know. I'm like, yeah. man, I've been in a couple of binds since then. Yeah. <laughs> you should, you should look him up. I was like, I never. You should I go should. back to the same bar. Yeah. Just like ask. in movies. I mean, that's what they do, right? <laughs> Just go back to the same bar. You'll bump into him. Yeah. You ever seen this guy around here? You know, he looks like this and that. Oh, you mean him? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. Yeah. I was actually at that bar the other day at eight in the morning because I went. <laughs> well, the only reason why is because I want to go to the federal building to yeah. get my. Uh, my passport renewed you know yeah. and and i had to be there at like six in the morning and then afterwards i took a lift to venice to just go get breakfast and then i walked from venice like from washington all the way to uh santa monica so it was a couple like you know three to four miles on but i walked it on the beach and it was like it was kind of a workout and by the, i was all sweaty and by the time i got there so i i went to i was waiting for the mac store to open so i went to um to that bar and 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 it was like full of a bunch of like europeans because there's the games or <laughs> like the okay. soccer the soccer is happening and so they were like you know loud and all that but like, i had a beer but it reminded me of that story i was like man i was sitting right there when i was talking uh, to halliburton dude one of the chinese boys you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no man it's uh that was about the time right when they were like in charge oh, oh yeah, yeah. oh crazy. man yeah that's uh it's just a trip you know it's a trip to like bump into these people where like you know i like my my politics are so far from like you know we if we were to talk politics we would have disagreed yeah, fast of but just a very friendly like nice guy bought me beers like I, you know I, we yeah. didn't discuss any we were just kind of we were just talking about whatever you Small know talk, yeah, yeah well, I don't, we, we must have talked something deep but we didn't I, he talked about travel he was just like you have to travel the world you have to see it and he was just saying how like you know, people are going to tell you that places are dangerous, but they're really not. Like, you yeah. can just go and be smart and whatever. Wow. But I was like, yeah, man, for you, you got, <laughs> you're walking <laughs> around with a bunch of, like, Halliburton water. protection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, that was, um, that was a trip. I haven't really done, like, the whole bullshitting at bars and meeting people. Nah. Oh, dude, I used to do it forever. I, <laughs> I, I could start. My favorite thing about smoking cigarettes was, was <laughs> to stand outside and, Somebody would ask you for a cigarette, and that that was already like a conversation would start. Yeah, you'd have a lot of conversations, and that would always lead to meeting people and just just this kind of talk, you know, bullshit yeah. talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool times. But I, I I used to wake be at bars at six in the morning sometimes. You know, when you Damn. said eight in the morning, I remember being at bars at six in the morning because they open at six. Oh, they do. I yeah, don't know. So, I've never been there that early. So you can drink till two, and then just like buy some beer so that you have beer to last <laughs> until six in the morning go back to another barn jesus man. yeah las palomas used to open at six we'd be there at six in the morning they still open that at six yep damn yep. and there's people there already yep oh every day yeah back in the days mr t's would open at six be there at six that's I would, crazy man yeah I, i'd stay in there because i knew the bartender so we'd like you know we'd close it drink till they opened <laughs> again at six in the morning where's that i miss you where's that well, Mr. T's is now where the Highland Park Bowl is, so oh, yeah. that got that thing got gentrified, Gents. super gentrified. That thing got. <laughs> yeah, that's a trip. You know, I was gonna I was gonna ask you about. You know, we're both big comedy fans, and that's you know that's why we walk also walk always, up. you know, talk about comedy. And um, when when do you think is like what was your first comedy show you ever went to? You think? Well, my first, I gotta go back to like I, when I was fourteen. Was the first time that I saw. Um, David Letterman, because I went to visit an uncle and I was 14 and he was like, if you want to watch TV late, you can. And that was like the first time that I was able to watch TV late. And I watched David Letterman for the first time. And I remember fucking just loving David Letterman. It was just like blown away by his corniness, you know, just like <laughs> yeah. crazy fucking corny jokes and shit. And so that was like 
my first time I started watching comedy. And then I would watch, I would try to find stuff. Back then we didn't have cable, you know, just like random stuff would come out on TV here and there. And whenever I got to hear comedy, I'd pay attention. And, you know, I, I thought I could write it, but I could never fucking write comedy. It's fucking hard, hard to write comedy. And it's one of those things that I bow down to because I know that I can't do it. And it's, it's, um, yeah. And so I, I mean, since then I've been following certain comics, watching certain things yeah. there, you know, this and that. And, but my, I started going to, um, the ice house in Pasadena when I was 18. Cause you can go there when you're 18. You just can't drink. Oh, I you, didn't know yeah, that. You can, I think it's 18 and over. It used to be. So you can go at 18 and over. Just, you just can't drink. I don't think they do that anymore. Cause I, I don't think I've noticed anybody. Cause, Cause he it, always asked. You used to have a, you used to have a wristband if you couldn't drink something like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, and since, I mean, the Ice House was pretty much the only place I would go to, and every once in a while I'd go to the Comedy Store and the the Improv on Melrose. But those three places, like, I'd try to hit as much as I could. And, and sometimes at the Improv on Melrose, you could, like, go at a certain hour and then just watch, like, a show, and then that show will end, and the, the next group of people will come in, and you just wait for the next group of people and watch it till, like, 2 in the morning. Yeah. So... There was some times where I That's stayed. how the story is right now, too. The original room, it just keeps going and going. Yeah, it just keeps going. So I would, you know, sit in these comedy clubs and just watch shit over and over. You know, I watched George Lopez when he was barely, you know, growing up. I watched um, Carlos Mencia. I've seen some really early Felipe Esparza. Uh, Gabriel Iglesias, I saw him. for The first time I saw him was at, at uh, the Santa Monica Pier. And that was, like, way at the beginning of his career. And just I don't know I've, I've I've been lucky enough to see like a lot of people that that are now you know huge celebrities and and uh, appreciate like their trajectory you know what they've yeah. done yeah yeah I mean and there's a lot of people that don't know these guys you know yeah. they, they don't know like you know Joey Diaz and <laughs> you uh, know these Uncle people Joey, have, yeah. these people that have put in so much work um, but I mean it's different now with the internet it's really easy to say. Hey, Joey Diaz, check it out, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you and send the link. Yeah. yeah, and back in the days, you didn't have that, you know? You just, like, prayed to one day see that person or, or you know, yeah. maybe if somebody had a tape or something. But, yeah, I mean, everything is really accessible right now, so that's a good thing. Or, yeah, that's a... Yeah, I remember one, one of the first shows I ever saw, um, it was um, my mom's, like, persistence helped me out. It was... It was uh, in El Centro, there's a p- police athletic league, you know, the PAL. And um, I don't know, one of the cops there, he was friends with, like, he was a comedy fan or he was friends with some comedians. And he would put together, like, these fundraisers for the for, for the police athletic league, you know. And then that hall, you know, people don't know that uh, Paul Rodriguez used to live in Hopeville. When he first <laughs> moved from Sinaloa to to uh, the U.S. He lived in Holville, like next wow. to El Centro. And so he lived down there. And then when he started making money, he hooked them up with, he hooked up El Centro with a, like a, like a, uh, a building to like a community wow. center. And it's in the north side, you know, it's in the hardest part of El Centro. Oh, and like, shit, there's like a boxing badass. ring in there. And, and like, and it's called like Paul Rodriguez Hall, you know? Wow. That's and uh, yeah, so they, he, he, one of the times he was going to come perform and, and, you know, Fluffy, Gabriel Iglesias was there. Um, I forgot some. Of the, it, it was hosted by by uh, Rudy. Yeah, Rudy Moreno. And Rudy Moreno and the then, Godfather. Uh, yeah, it was it, it was uh, it was really awesome. And I was it, it was the twenty one plus event, and I was thirteen, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, man, I want to go. And then I told my mom, and she's like, "Te voy a llevar y vas a preguntar." I'm like, "No, I don't want to do that. Too much pressure." He's like, "Te voy a llevar," and she takes me and she like makes me get off, and asks like, and so I get down. I'm just like just like stone like you know all quiet and awkward <laughs> and like this cop guy that's there he's like you know there's the police guys are setting it up so um he he asked me he's like uh he's like what do you he's like what do you uh, what do you want i'm like uh, my mom wants me to ask that if i can somehow see the show and he was like oh yeah go to that van and grab all those grocery bags and bring them into the kitchen so i just grabbed it and it was a bunch like food stuff you know yeah. hot dogs and stuff so i bring him inside and he's like, be here tomorrow at like six or something. The event started at eight. So I get the next day, I go to six and um, 
I, I show up and that cop dude's there and he's like, all right, so your job is going to be to be the bartender for the comedian. Wow. He's like, you can't go out in the hall because you're not supposed to be out there, but, <laughs> but you, you can stay, serve beer you at serve your beer. little age. Yeah, exactly. I was like, what? And so I'm going to report that cop. Give me yeah. a <laughs> Just kidding. He was a cool cop. Yeah. Nah. But anyways, you know, that was one of the only times I talked to police, you know? <laughs> but it's, uh, no, that guy, I was like, for reals, man, you can, but to me, I was, I thought it was the coolest thing. Yeah, ever, of you course. Know? That's fucking bad. And, uh, yeah. And then they had a wrestling ring and I remember like Gabriel was there and he was like, you know, we were like wrestling in the ring together and he was doing like the sumo stuff. Uh, it was really funny, you know, and, and then Paul Rodriguez was there and I remember his, his set, like I'll always remember his set, how he was like, it was super <laughs> grimy, but he was making fun of how like. Like he was just hating yeah. on the town. You let, know? Me, let me hear your best Paul Rodriguez. That's I can't do. <laughs> no, no, but it was it, it wasn't even like the the voice. It was more just like the stories of like just going to Mexicali and like uh, flushing the toilet and like all the water came up and uh, it, like wet as webbles <laughs> and shit, you know. <laughs> and shit, it's dumb dumb uh, jokes, but yeah, it was really funny. Toilet you know? humor. Yeah, the uh, but I but Gabriel killed that night. I was like, man, and yeah. like some of the. It was before people, because I used to watch Get Locals like yeah. uh, religiously, you know, yeah, yeah. and like he was starting to come out. And I remember I was a really big fan of him and Willie Barcena, you yeah. know. And I didn't uh, watch Get Locals, but I used to see all those people live because it was right yeah. here at Dice House. Well, they used to, they used to tape it at Dice House. They used house. to tape it there, right? And yeah. they had the brick wall, the cheesy ass yeah, brick wall. Yeah, they would put the fake there. brick wall. Do you ever see any of those tapings? Uh, no, I never made it to those tapings, but those same people would be at like Latino nights, you yeah. Know? So it was like. And that was killer. What was the other spot over here in Montebello that, that Felipe always talks about? Oh, Gotham? Yeah, that was in Montebello? Like, yeah. It yeah, was the so, hood. That was a Cholo one, right? Yeah, it's still there. It's a restaurant. I think it's called <laughs> Tortillas. Well, it was always a restaurant. Yeah. And back then, it was Gotham Bar and Grill. Dude, Gotham Bar and Grill was fucking badass. But, yeah. like, comedians got tested there because it was a bar full of drunks. <laughs> Yeah. And they would sell, they were famous for a beer schooner. It was a, a giant, like, bowl of beer, you know? So, like Campechana kind of guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like one of those. So you drink in a schooner, and, you know, and people would get wasted there all the time. And the stage, like, had tables on it, too. So, like, the comedian is here, and there's, like, tables around him. And there's people standing up, and there's always sports on TV and shit like that. Wow, so, the comedians on stage? Yeah, but they were, like, no volume, but you had to compete with a lot of shit. So. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Like, you know, people would get out there and get tested, you know. But, and the, and I mean, the, that was, there would be heckling and stuff? Oh, a lot of heckling, fights. Um, yeah, yeah. There was Is that a lot where of Oscar there. de La Hoya used to show up Yeah, all the Oscar time? de La Hoya would be there a lot. Cause he he, up he his... lived in Montebello at that time. Yeah. So it was Jeff Garcia. And Jeff Garcia was like a really skinny guy. I don't think you've heard him too much, huh? No. Well, Jeff was a big part of the scene back then, and, and he ended up going to like to do animation and stuff. Wow. He still does uh, stand up. I've heard too. the name, but I don't think you, I. You definitely got to check out Jeff Garcia. Jeff Garcia is like the bad boy of comedy back then. And he was actually on Culture Clash's show. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was one of the stand ups that they had on that way back on TV. Um, but Jeff Garcia would always make fun of Oscar, and he was like a skinny guy saying he's going to kick Oscar's ass, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Alonzo Bodden, I don't know if you know him, but no. he's he's um, um some black dude that also like won one of the last comic standings. He used to do a lot of shows there too. I'd see him there all the time. Felipe Esparza, Gabriel Iglesias, um, Alfred Robles too. Um, I don't know. I just everybody used to go there. Uh, I don't think I don't know if George Lopez ever went to that one. He was already like doing bigger um stages and shit at that time. But but. Yeah, he probably did, I, but I never saw him there. But that was the spot. It was pretty much like like a nightclub atmosphere, but comedy. Yeah. Yeah. That was cool, though. You got to see a lot of really good comedians back then. A yeah, I wish, I wish Boyle Heights had like a comedy spot, you know? Well, fingers crossed. Um, it, it's not just like having a comedy spot, but it's having somebody that can really get the right people on. Yeah. <laughs> That would be yeah. cool to see. Like I, I don't know. I would, like I go. I try to go to the to the store. You know, once every two weeks. Yeah. Like now it's like once a month. But I, if I lived close by it, I'd be there all the time. I'd be there every night. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, comedy is. Oh, fuck. It's, it's therapeutic for me. Yeah. Because <laughs> I really go and I just, I just, <laughs> I laugh where I'm like obnoxious to the guys next to me. You know. Yeah. But you know, it's it's my way of kind of dealing with shit. You know? Yeah. And, you know, even 
comedy to me it's not not even on that not even on just the release like for me it was like George Carlin like the way that how critical he was you know mm. like just the way that he can he wouldn't just tell a joke he would research everything about mm. it and then give you all the stats give you all the all the math mm. you know everything He'd and then, really nerd out <laughs> oh man and I love that stuff and, that, and that's kind of I mean for the same reason why I love uh, James Baldwin you know like yeah. he, he was he's a writer you know but he, the way that he could just kind of break things down so simple like very complex yeah. you know whether it's about race or so, like social uh, you know ills is, like yeah. he would just break him down where help you understand it yeah. and I feel like I need that because I, I don't I'm not an academic I don't know some of these big words and I always feel like going way too over people's heads is just more like people just kind of flexing for no reason. Like to yeah. me, communication is about just trying yeah, to understanding. Yeah. Just, and it should be democratic. It should be for everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, anything else you, you want to, you want to cover? There's mm. a lot of stuff. Can't think of anything right now. I think, uh, how about you? What are you up to? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're busy I, as fuck. I'm just doing contract stuff, man, nonstop. I love it. I, you know, Hitman. Yeah, exactly. I like the idea of, uh, I always wanted to be where I'm at now, just being a working artist constantly. Yeah, That's yeah. all I do. Um, but yeah, no, I, I wanted to, what's, what's some more questions I, I was thinking about when we were talking? Um, what's something that just keeps you inspired to keep shooting, to keep creating, to keep writing? Like, is it, you know, your your family, your your kid is it? I was having know? this conversation today with um, Manuel Lopez, um, the painter, mm -hmm. and uh, I've always been attracted to the creative process. So it's like it's a process of building. It's a process of you know even like the process of opening a, a radio when I was a kid. You know to look. At, I did all that shit yeah. back in the days. Like I can fix your outlets. I can fix your lights. I can fix certain, you know, um, uh, with no permit. Yeah, I can <laughs> fix certain appliances, all that shit. Cause I used to look into that shit and, and, and learn it and then create it. Um, it, learning it helps you, you know, create it. But now it's like things like, uh, you know, um, like the movie thing, like, like I need to learn that shit. <laughs> you know, I need yeah. to learn, I need to learn, how to get my point across the way I want to do it in the film. And I'm fucking old, you know, I'm 45 years old. And I tell a lot of like young artists, like you're lucky that, you know, at 21 that you're an artist. I didn't know that yet. And nobody pushed me towards that. You know, I was pushed more like fucking at least go work at the onion fields, you know, something, you know, I, I was never pushed towards the arts. So a lot of young artists are really lucky right now because they could start, they could start, um, developing that, you know, and, and, and trying to see what they can create. So I, at a late time in my life, I, I'm starting to like develop this idea to make a film, you know, I mean, I guess I've done like other stuff, but I've never shot like a film myself, you know, I've never, so, so that the, the, the research or whatever, the work that I need to do to get there is what inspires me. Like, like yeah. the process is of figuring something out. It's like, you know, a puzzle yeah so like figuring out the puzzle is what is what motivates me it really like um it really inspires me you know i start to look at at videos on cinematography and i'm just fucking lost you know i pick up another book on cinematography and i'm just like lost in that you know like damn this is you know it's a whole new it's a whole new um place to dive into and and nerd out you know yeah. just like like um yeah, I mean it's it's I'm I'm really scared of this. It's fucking hard, you know. It's fucking hard, and uh, I'm really scared. I've I've worked on a lot of movie sets um, where I was a photographer, and I've seen you know, I've seen stuff shot, and, and it's not easy. And having a big crew is not easy, and and managing all that is not easy. I'm gonna start really small, but in the end, um, fingers crossed that I can you know, pull it off someday. Yeah, no, I think yeah. I think you can, man. It's it's just. Uh... Yeah, then having all that just life experience is going to show well through the film, I think. And, yeah. you know, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a trip, man. I, you know, that, that right now we we're talking about the process, like that's and, and just the thought behind it. You know, my, my favorite art or my favorite movies are all like the, the really thoughtful stuff, you know, yeah. the 
whether it's about family, whether it's about, you know, trying to get you to think of something and, and like someone's really pushing, you know, their, their soul onto whatever they're making. Like, that's my favorite. You know, that's one of my favorite artists right yeah. now is, is uh, Rafa Esparza, you know, and yeah. just the way that, you know, you just see that it's Adobe, but if you really, <laughs> yeah. if you really see what it's about, it's much yeah. deeper. And then just the, the political, uh, and like the social connotations of what Adobe is yeah. and like, you know, the de decolonial structures. And then, but his whole, the reasoning for doing it, it's like he building a connection with his dad, you know, and, yeah. and, and all these, you know, he's kind of, he's one of the first people I've seen. I, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people but where really explain his work that he's creating work while healing his own wounds about his life. Yeah. You know? And, and I think that like, I was like, man, this guy's killing two birds, one stone. Like <laughs> I, I'm over here trying to do shit separately when I should be merging it. Uh, and like, and, you know, it made me think about that. But, uh, but then at the same time, I'm like, it's, I feel too vulnerable, like trying to heal my stuff out in, in the open like that. But then yeah. sometimes it's just like, man, if, if it, if it works, then give it a shot, you know, but it's, um, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough to put your shit out there, but but yeah, you should. I mean, you do. You you have some shots too that are you have some work too that's pretty much um that is about your experience and you know like your anxiety clock <laughs> and your stuff yeah. like that. You know you, exactly. You've also worked through through your own stuff through your art. I've seen it because we've had these conversations before you even start the piece. You yeah, know? And, you're right. But and so you definitely work through your stuff too. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's it's. Oh, it's a it's it's a cathartic, you know, yeah. to do something and and you know get to that point where you've put so much into it and 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 you let go of stuff too while doing it. And that's what theater used to be for me too. Like theater was always like releasing shit. It was and it, it was right after my brother had died, so there was a lot of like I had a lot to release, you know. So like theater was my therapy back then. Theater was like that's probably why I fell into it so hard because it was a place to really um have emotions and thoughts that I couldn't really have in regular life, but I could do them on stage and let go of them and leave them there. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um so what do you one of the things I keep thinking about always is, you know, when when we're talking and having these conversations and Hopefully, you know, younger folks, like younger artists could, could uh, you know, they could be listening. And, you know, that that's what I do a lot of times. I listen to podcasts, whether it's Rogan or Marin or, you know, Felipe. And it's I'm, I'm usually working while I'm listening to it. I'm trying to get, you know, I, I get all kinds of pointers of stuff all the time. And, you know, what do you think? Like, what's something that you would you would tell, like, you know, the younger artists working on stuff now or, you know, the young yeah. version of yourself? What would you the only thing that I say the most, like what, whatever it is you're doing, like do a lot of it, yeah. <laughs> you know, like when I was doing theater, <laughs> I did a lot of theater when I was, uh, you know, doing, um, whatever the fuck else I was doing. I do that when I was doing music and you know, I was doing a lot of music. I was always at rehearsals, always, you know, trying to write and whatever. And like now that I'm doing photos, you know, I'm taking a lot of fucking pictures, especially yeah. when I started. I mean, I was right now I'm not taking as many as I did the first year, but I'm still taking a lot of pictures and I'm still trying to find ideas. And, and, um, sometimes I, I meet kids that are saying like, you know, I want to do that one day. I'm like, well do it, <laughs> you know, yeah. just start, start working on whatever it is. And, and some people are afraid to fail and, and it's not a failure. It's a learning experience. You know, it's just like, you really just have to start doing it. You have to start doing it t to, um, to get it and to also know if you really fucking want to do it you know like you're gonna know after you do it for a while if you want to keep doing it or not or if something else takes over then you probably didn't really want to do that that much but but just do it as much as you could as much as you could all the time and perfect it and work on it and learn about it and and of course look at other people that are doing the same thing so so if you're you know, uh, if you're a basketball player, you know, look at other people playing basketball. If you're if you're a trumpet player, you know, look at other people that played trumpet. And, and if you're a photographer, look at other photographers. And and you don't have to emulate anybody, but you might when you're working because it'll just, just happened, come natural. Yeah. yeah. But but um, that's how you start to learn until you can create your own voice. You have to start by doing, you know, painting what other people paint in or, or using the styles that other people use until you develop your own. But definitely just do it consistency consistency is one of the most important things you know 
be consistent. Do it a lot. That's, yeah. that's like my favorite thing to tell people. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think it's been pretty good so far, right? Eh? Yeah. You want to close off with like any any story? I, I love stories, you know, so it's always... Uh, I always love listening to like just a solid story. I don't know if you got something offhand or, or we could just cut it right there. <laughs> How about the story of when we were doing a podcast and we ended it? This guy. <laughs> we'll cut it before. Yeah, yeah. I don't have it. Okay, so that concludes our first episode. Um, thank you, Rafa, for being our first guest. Um, shout out to Eduardo Arenas for letting us use the music for the intro. The title is called Mala Costumbrada. It's off his record called Nariz. And if you look him up on Spotify, it's E. Arenas. A R E N A S. Amazing record. Go check it out. Um, and thank you, Mario, for helping uh, spice this together and then setting me up here in my studio. Please stay tuned, and we're going to have much more guests. And, you know, hopefully, you guys dig what, what we're doing here. Thank you. Hey.